Cool. It's great. Thank you for coming. It's such a miserable morning to be inside. Um, either you should be shoveling or you should be skiing or both. So, um, so I'm sorry that, that you're stuck in here, but thank you. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to have you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here. Um, I've been giving some version of this talk my whole career. Uh, 15 years ago, I said sort of the same things, but with none of the same slides. I keep replacing them. If you've heard me in the last year or two, you'll recognize some of the slides, but, but it keeps evolving. And the biggest change is simply how much easier it has become to solve this problem. And it's, you know, when we started this, the only thing you could do with a solar cell was have a calculator. I had a really nice solar calculator. And you could put it on satellites. And now, as I'm going to show you, it's the cheapest electricity in human history. And so that's where we're going to go here. So we'll see if we can click forward. OK, so thanks. I'm, I mean, it's such a fantastic professor. Now, Professor Emeritus, founding this was wonderful. The team that has put this together is superb. And, and a real hat tip to you for doing this. And like I say, thank you for coming. If you see a penguin picture, I took it in one of my expeditions. And it's just to lighten up something that may occasionally get heavy. The content wrapped around the penguins is supposed to be important, OK? So what we're going to do, I'm going to walk through something that's very, very not new, which is how we have used history, energy over time. I'm going to tell you how much we love fossil fuels. And you all sort of know this, but, but it's worth, they're good but how much better we can do with something else. So that's where we're going here. Um, the challenge is, as I'm gonna say in a bit, we really do rely on fossil fuels for our well-being. We spent a hundred plus years making a system that works and we gotta change it in 30 years and we gotta change it in 30 years while climate change is making our lives harder. And that's the challenge that we're up against. At the end of that, we can have a better world, right? And the progress in the last 15 years is flabbergasting, just flabbergasting. But this is the one. If you just want one slide and then get the heck out of here, this is probably the one, is to remember that we can solve problems. There's a whole lot of people spending money now to convince you that we can't. This is too big for us. We can't do anything. We're screwed. There's nothing you can do. It's gonna, it, we can do this, right? And so what I did up there is I put up a picture of a do-it-yourself cell phone kit, right? It's just a little bit of, of quartz crystals for the, the glass and the silicon chip. And it's a little bit of, of some sort of organic matter for the plastics. And it's the right rocks, the ones with the palladium and the rare earth elements. And that's all it is, is sand, oil, and rocks. And Einstein and, you know, Bohr. And, and it, it's true. The GPS has both general and special relativity in it. And the size of the correction, if we hadn't had Einstein, the nice lady in the phone would start to get lost in two minutes, right? Because the satellite is higher in Earth's gravity well, going faster than you are, so you need both of them. And if we can do this, we can sure as heck do energy. You know, energy's easy compared to that. So, so that's the big one, so energy use. Right, I had my, my cereal this morning. So far, I'm on track for my 2,000 calories per day. Uh, some days I go a little over. I like donuts, but uh, you know. At any rate, um, a human diet of 2,000 calories per day, if you put it on the table and burn it for 24 hours and measure the energy coming off, it's 100 watts. And there's many of you in this audience that remember 100 watts was one old light bulb almost entirely heat. If I had to ride my bicycle to make the electricity that's running the projector, I would be out of breath. A, um, a Tour de France rider can do 500 watts, but they're eating 10,000 calories a day, okay? But I don't have to run the projector and I don't have to heat this room. And I 
never pay Penn State for parking, but I did today. I, I was doing student grades, uh, updates on how they're doing all morning, and I came over at the last minute, and so I drove over. Um, and, and it's not very far, but, but what's, there's no one of you. I guarantee you that there is no one in this room who spent the entire summer last year hoeing corn so you would not starve to death this winter, all right? What is done for us in the United States is a hundred times what we could do for ourselves. In the world, it averages 25 times. Ours is a hundred. So the heating and the cooling and the cooking and the plowing, the energy use is a hundred times what we can do. And it's 83% fossil fuel. Okay. This is why this is a hard problem because our well being depends on this and it's fossil fuel. We could do, it'd be fascinating to say, how many different ways could you tell human history? And is it our politics? Is it our leaders? Is it our workers? Is it our inventors? Is it, you know, is it our artists? But, but you could tell it as a story of energy. And ever since we discovered fire and taming animals, we've been trying to get something else to do our work for us. And you burn something for fire a lot faster than nature makes more and you get pollution and you get trouble and sometimes it escapes and burns things you love and, and then you get a shortage and then we fight each other over it and then you find something else to burn and then you do it again. And so I'm gonna show you a little of this, right? So you probably all know we are here because of this. And Penn State is founded by the Iron Masters. The Iron Masters, at the time they were doing it, it looked like this. This is um, uh, Hopewell Furnace down towards Philly, but it will do. They put the furnace where it is so that the, the Thompson Run could run the water wheel that made the blast. They're taking red dirt and the limestone flux and they're making the iron that built the East. But the main energy is not the water wheel. The main energy is charcoal. And, you know, I was out yesterday and jogged around Collier Lake, which is named after the Colliers or Colliers. And this is what they did. You cut trees and you make a big pile. You'd bury them in dirt. So these guys did it when they were young. And then between the world wars, they recreated it for history. And so this is a reenactment of people who were much older than when they did it for their profession. But they're burying it in dirt. You're gonna burn it with restricted oxygen to drive off the water and some other things and make charcoal that would burn hotter. And it's just hot enough to smelt the iron. And if the dirt broke, some poor schmo would have to climb up on the pile and fix it and hope you didn't fall in and die. Uh, just a horrible, horrible undertaking. And it did this. So the, the typical number you find most commonly is that a furnace won. And the people who took care of the furnace and had to live, cook. Between that, it was a square mile of trees a year. I've got a picture that I, at the end of this in my computer, that's a, a one in... in New Jersey, there was two square miles of trees a year they were using. But, but think a furnace is a square mile of trees a year. Okay, 20, 20 virgin forest, to walk for 20 minutes past the trees, square it off, and, and that's one year. And then it's 50 years until you can do it again. So you need another square mile, and then you need another square mile, and then you need another square mile. Well, if you go to a gazetteer of Pennsylvania, Every line on the left there is a furnace. And there's a whole bunch more. When you drive over to Shavers Creek to see Jane the Crane, you'll pass one that's not on this list. They're back in the woods. They're not doing anything anymore. These are the ones that are still on the map. So everything on there is a furnace. Square mile of trees a year when it was running. And then they made pig iron, and then the pig iron is shipped to a forge, and the ones on the right are the forges. The bottom line is Valley Forge. But so everything on there and a whole lot more is a square mile of trees per year just for iron. This isn't all the other things we're doing with wood. 
And it did this, right? We are Pennsylvania, we are Penn's Woods. They said when the first European settlers arrive in the new world, a squirrel could have gone up a tree on the Atlantic coast and stayed in the trees to the Mississippi. We have Rothrock State Forest, which is named after the first forester of the Commonwealth, who was Rothrock. And Rothrock wrote about the Pennsylvania desert about 1900. Now, it wasn't a desert. It still rained. But essentially, Pennsylvania was treeless. You'd go find the virgin forest, a little bit of cut forest, but you go look for it and ask what didn't get cut. It's tiny. We have a million deer in Pennsylvania. There might have been a few. We pretty much got rid of the turkeys. We got rid of the bears. We, we re-imported elk from the Rockies because we got to get of them. And there's no nittany lions. There wasn't a, a deer to eat and there wasn't a tree to do it behind. Um, why do we have Groundhog Day rather than Bear Day or Badger Day as they used in the old world because we didn't have bears. A groundhog was the biggest thing we had left that they could use, right? We just cleaned it out. Now it wasn't just us. So here's Cape Cod. And you all know Cape Cod. First encounter beach where the pilgrims first meet the native people is right there in the town of East Ham. The pilgrims say, oh, it's so goodly. It was a goodly land and wooded to the brinky of the sea. And then still in the 1600s, a human lifetime later, the pilgrims of East Ham say, we are going to outlaw your own ability to cut your own tree on your own property because we have deforested everything and we're panicked and we don't know what to do because there's nothing left. Thoreau walks the Cape in 1855, and he says, many of the people get all their fuel from the beach. So if there's a shipwreck, you can burn it and cook dinner. If there's a tree drifts across from the logging operations in Maine, you can burn it and cook dinner. But otherwise, you have nothing to use to cook dinner. And a lot of it, they had been boiling seawater with wood to get salt so they could pack cod that they could ship to England and trade. And that they finally fixed with renewables. They used windmills and solar drying troughs. Manhattan, the Common Council in the 1600s is hiring inspectors to make sure that you're not getting robbed when you buy a cord of wood because there's so much scarcity. Governments are getting in people's faces already in the 1600s. We're fighting over in the 1700s. There's actually a mill dam taken out down there, down there, Lancaster, because the dams were needed for energy, but it was blocking the fish run. And so you're, you're fighting between the fishers and the, and the energy persons already, right? Now, if you've ever tried to read by firelight or try to do 12 stitches to the inch on a quilt by candlelight, it's miserable, right? right. So what do you do? If you're a poor person, you burn a biofuel called campfine, alcohol and turpentine. It was pretty cheap. It burned pretty well. It was really explosive. And there's these horrible stories. You know, the Methodist minister and his wife go off to visit the parishioners and the three daughters try to refill the lamp and it blows up and burns the house down and kills them all. And so rich people burned whales. So you, you take wads of money and you send it to New England and they take lots of sailors and they put them on boats and they go kill whales and they cook them and they get whale oil. And so this is the history of whale oil in the Yankee fleet. And um, in 1800 to 1880, and I'll see if I can make this work. So over here is 1800 on the left, 1880 on the right. They're learning how to do it. They've got 10,000 sailors on ships out of New England scouring the world ocean for whales. And they can't find many more whales. And, and the fleet gets crushed in the sea ice off of Alaska and the insurance goes through the roof. And they sort of quit. Um, 
there were some faster whales that, that you couldn't catch with those sailing ships and Norwegians and Japanese and Russian killed them with diesel and harpoon cannons. When they finally quit, there's no economic resource left. We had burned them all. Um, you know, there's a few around, but so, so the price, as they got good at it, they drove down the price. This is $7 a gallon in modern money for lamp oil. When they hit peak whale oil, it goes up $25 a gallon. And at that point, somebody goes up the road right up here. Oil is leaking out of the ground. Oil has been leaking out of the ground for a long time. The native people knew this. They used this. And they say, hey, if oil leaks out of the ground, maybe there's oil in the ground. And so you see the first modern oil well there. Now, if you took all of the whale oil, 100 years of Yankee whaling, 10,000 sailors at the peak, you took all that oil and you put it in our pipelines, you put it in, it would last the US 11 hours. The idea that somehow we go back to trees and whales when we run out of fossil fuels is absurd. But we have trees and whales because we let them grow back because we quit burning them so fast because we switched what we burned. And that is not a new idea. If you go up to the Whaling Museum in New Bedford, you can see this. It is a, um, an editorial cartoon just before the US Civil War, 1861, in the magazine Vanity Fair. And it was entitled The Grand Ball Given by the Whales in honor of the discovery of the oil wells in Pennsylvania. And you can look up there right next to my laser pointer. It says, the oil wells of our native land, may they never secede. Oil's well that ends well. We wail no more for our blubber. The, the frogs down here doing drinks are really cool. Uh, <laughs> Right? We have whales and trees because we quit burning them. And they knew it before the Civil War. This is a piece of sheet music from 1864. This is the American Petroleum Polka. We're going to dance to oil. This oil well through pure oil, 100 feet high. Now, oil was black when that, then. It still is. It always will be. But you can't have black oil raining on her pink dress, so they made the oil white. <laughs> True. Um, right, so, so the trees and the whales grew back in 100 years, and they had lots of troubles until then. Uh, the fossil fuels will grow back in 100 million. The idea that somehow we can have a sustainable future that, that involves fossil fuels is just laughably wrong. We either burn and then we learn, and you saw what happened to price, or we learn while we burn. And if we burn before we learn, we're going to be really, really unhappy because the climate change is going to be huge and then we're going to have scarcity. And then we're, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so the bottom line about global warming is physics that was worked out in the 1800s. So the knowledge that we are warmer than we should be because of a greenhouse effect is Fourier in 1824. The um, role of CO2 was first Eunice Foote in the US in 1851, I think, and then Tyndall after that. Uh, first calculation of the warming from fossil fuel emissions is 1896. The modern version with quantum mechanics is made up by the Air Force after World War II. Now they were tasked with doing things like, what sensor should I put on my heat-seeking missile? I'm looking for the infrared from the hot exhaust of the enemy bomber, but if I put the wrong sensor on, the CO2 absorbs the signal and my heat-seeking missile gets lost and it doesn't work. And so they got some good physicists and they figured out what absorbs what. They predicted what satellites would measure before the satellites were launched, they were right. They predicted how it would change as we burn fossil fuels, they would write. And so if you go up in a satellite and you look back at the Earth, this is the Earth sending back to space the energy we get from the sun so we don't burn up to a crisp. And this is what does not get out, it keeps us warmer because of CO2. 
It's just physics. And if you add more CO2, more is absorbed. It's just physics. You meet someone that says, do you believe in global warming? Do you believe in the Air Force? I'm sorry. Okay. And like I say, the warming effect of adding CO2 is not the least bit surprising. What's surprising, Arrhenius calculated it, but he said, I don't think we'll ever burn that much fossil fuel to make a difference. I've done the calculation. It takes a lot. And his physics was pretty good for pre-quantum. His, his economics stunk. All right. This is just a scaling. This is just, you know what trash looks like. You can see it. We put out trash for the trash collectors. In the U.S., we throw away at the curb for a trash collector to take away in a trash truck about a half a ton per person per year. Our share of the CO2 is almost 16 tons per person per year. Okay, That's the surprising thing. It's just how good fossil fuel companies were giving us what we asked for. Okay. Now, that matters a lot. I'm going to come back to the good news. Just stay with me. But, but if we don't use this knowledge, if we double down on fossil fuels, so we crank up, we burn our way into the future, what do we expect? First of all, we've burned the easy oil. The, the story about the man named Jed who was shooting at some food and barely kept his family fed, those of you who remember, that kind of easy oil's gone. But there's a lot of tar sands. There's a lot of oil shales. If we burn it all, the coming changes are a lot bigger than the past changes in climate. A little bit of warming, you might have liked it. It was not quite as cold last night. But then we start running out of adaptive capacity and when it starts getting too hot to live in places and then it gets really bad. So we've used up the cheap warming and we're headed into the expensive warming and the costs go up a lot faster than the temperature does. And I'll show you a little bit. The uncertainties are heavily on the bad side. A little better, a little worse, a lot worse. Okay. What do we worry about? There's work been done here at Penn State and other places. At present, there is nowhere on earth that has to be fatal. There are people dying of heat in the summer, but they don't have to if they were careful. Earth's history very clearly shows times when nature had slowly raised CO2 a lot and when it would have been too hot for us to live in a lot of places on the planet. We just couldn't have done it. We could make places on Earth fatal within the lifetime of our students. As in, you are sitting there in the shade, in the wind, naked, drinking water, and you're going to die because your body cannot lose heat. Okay, we could do that. Long before that, people don't want to live there. They're getting out. They're refugees. There's problems. Uh, sea level rise is what we work on. We're going to get that. Uh, I'm going to show you more floods and more droughts, more energy for the strongest storms, uh, loss of defense against many diseases, ecological stresses, extinctions, and really bad for all future generations and poor people in hot places now. So that's the picture. I'll show you a couple pieces of that picture. This is a picture from Syria. There was a drought in the region. Did the drought cause a civil war? No. A lot of countries around Syria did not have a civil war, but Syria was the least happy country and it broke. And it's pretty clear that the, the drought contributed to the conflict. Did we cause the drought? Well, we loaded the dice to come up drought. It came up drought. The least happy country broke. Okay. This is the future of drought. Okay. So if we do not change our energy system, by the time our students are old, what happens to drought? Green is less drought. And no, you're not farming in the Sahara. It's still sand. Every other color on there is more drought. It's just how much more. And that arrow is pointing to Syria where drought is already implicated in bad things. Lots more drought. Yeah. This is for the Americas and focused on us. Uh, this will be history and future. Blue is wet and brown is drought. 
So let's see if this spins. So you're going to see a clock that starts running there in 1950. And it watch as it comes through today and into the future, what happens to drought? This is if we don't change our ways. Now, no, we are not moving to Alaska. We're not growing our crops. The soils are not there. Um, this is change in weeks that are appropriate for mega fires, for California style fires. Gray is still a low number, but the browns along the coast and headed up the Appalachians there are our future. We could see a world in which California type mega fires or across Canada mega fires are coming up the spine of the Appalachians and they're coming up the East Coast. Okay, but more floods too. When it's ready to rain, warmer air has more water, it can rain harder. Then it dries out faster because, you know, every clothes dryer and every hair dryer has a heating element for a reason. And so you get more variability, you get more floods and more droughts. The upper left one there is what has happened over recent decades. Every section of the U.S. is getting more intense rainfalls. The lower one is what is projected to happen in the future, even more, more intense rainfalls. And that leads to things like this. So the upper left map, bluer is more of the properties in that county are subject to flood. And this over here is the official FEMA estimate. The counties in blue have a lot of property that is subject to flooding. The upper right is what if we take account of the increasing rainfall and we do a little better job of mapping. And so this is from, from a different group. And so independent estimate from the First Street Foundation. And this is what FEMA is telling people, but this is what they come up with for who is subject to flood and blue is subject to flood, right? And this is the difference. So bluer on here is more of the properties in a county are subject to flooding, but don't know it. And the peak in there is 40% of the properties in a county think they're safe, but they're not. And they probably don't have flood insurance, but they're prone to a flood in the coming decades. Right, that's a lot of property, a lot of people, a lot of lives, a lot of disruption, a lot of money. Right. Sea level rise. Right. So this is data. The sea level is rising. This already matters. So I swiped these, these slides from various sources, and they're given there. Um, this is Fort Lauderdale. This is not a canal. It's a street. This is not a storm. It's a high tide. OK. So this is, they call it nuisance flooding and they call this adaptation, okay? Um, <laughs> don't splash salt water on my plants, yeah. Okay, this is a parking garage in Miami. Um, the octopus swam in there. Uh, they, they call this nuisance flooding. This is a high tide, it's not a storm. If you've seen the, the video of the, the condominium pancaking, it might make you nervous that there's salt water around the pillars of the building but they call it nuisance flooding. And then you get this, right? At some point, what are you gonna do? It's a nuisance, it's a nuisance, it's $10 billion. It's $50 billion, it's $100 billion in various places, okay? Costs go up faster than the temperature, costs go up faster than the ocean, okay? This is Hurricane Gustav in New Orleans. I would not have wanted to be that peace officer. This one stayed outside. We are already committed, we're confident, to sea level rise that will require raising that wall. But there's a chance, and this is in the most recent UN reports, there's a chance of sea level rise out of that picture. The, the, what they're hoping for leaves Antarctica basically untouched but Antarctica can raise sea level almost 200 feet. So a little change in Antarctica is a big change in the ocean. 
And so the uncertainties on this, we're projecting sea level rise. What are the uncertainties? A little less, a little more, a lot more. Can't be a lot less, but it can be a lot more. Okay. So I worked with the UN. This is us in, in Paris at UNESCO headquarters in 2007, trying to make the, you know, the UN IPCC in some ways is the mother of all committees. It is, if you printed out all the documents that it's ever released, they'd, they'd make it to the ceiling. And if you turned them into a very short thing, it would be this. Okay. Imagine a future where we just burn and ignore what we know, and then say, what happens if we use that knowledge wisely? We have to use it, we have to do it well, but if we do it well, we actually do know, we can pound on the table about this, that we end up with a larger economy in which more people have jobs, they are healthier, our nations are more secure, and by the way, the environment is better and we're more ethical. Okay, using our knowledge right now, it doesn't matter if you're interested in economy or jobs, in health or security, in environment or ethics, they're all in the same direction. So I'm gonna show you one slide for each of those six color bullets. I served on a committee with Bill Nordhaus. Uh, he won the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018. He built integrated assessment models. You are a policymaker and you have resources. People want to consume now to help themselves, to feed their kids, to buy houses, to do things. People want to invest broadly to grow the economy into the future. People want to target investments to solve particular problems like curing malaria or climate change. What's the best distribution to help the most people now and in the future? He built models to try to do that. All of those models now say the same thing. We are not investing enough in climate change to be good for the economy. We are underinvesting in climate change purely based on economics. Yeah. Now, I worked for an oil company one summer. A lot of our students have gone to work for oil companies. Oil companies make good jobs, no question. But it's fairly clear that anything else we do for our energy makes more good jobs. And the reason, at least a lot of the reason, is linked to the fact that the cheapest producers of oil in the world can do it for about five or $10 a barrel, maybe in Russia, maybe somewhere else, but they can do it for five or $10 a barrel but we give them 50 or 100 for that barrel. And the difference in that, the economists call it rent, but the difference in that is we're not paying them to make the resource useful. We're paying them because they control it. And so they work to control the resource rather than paying workers to make the resource useful. And if you switch your money to the solar cells on our roof, or to conservation, the people that insulated the house better, a worker has to come do that. And so, like I say, oil makes good jobs, but it's fairly clear that anything else is better for your money making jobs rather than paying the people who control that resource. Okay. There was a study here in 21, 20% of the deaths globally are significantly premature because of people breathing gunk that comes off of fossil fuel burning. Coal especially, but um, people are getting sick because we're making fires happen more often and those, those fires are putting gunk in the air. I'll bet a lot of you were hiding inside last summer when the Canadian smoke was here. Okay, making it too hot to live, making it, uh, spreading of diseases, flooding people and having disease come in the flood waters. So all of those groups uh, in that little fine print up there are US medical organizations and they got together and they said, if we wanna be healthy, we have to get off of fossil fuels. 
We want to be healthy. Get off of this. Our military leaders, this is the CNA Military Advisory Board, a bunch of retired military leaders. I have a picture of one of them up there. Uh, he happens to be a friend. He also is a Penn Stater, uh, now retired. Um, but he had the best business card I have ever seen in my life. Because Dave Tetley, when he was a rear admiral, was in charge of the Naval Observatory. And that meant he was the navigator of the Navy. So he has a business card that says navigator of the Navy, also said oceanographer of the Navy. Um, the board looked at this and they said, you know something, if we make it too hot for people to live, they're gonna cross borders. And where people are crossing borders, they're not happy. And there's all sorts of politics and all sorts of unhappiness go on. And, and you know, if we're going to have a peaceful world with secure borders, we need actionable agreements on ways to stabilize climate change. Right? This is our military leaders. And then there's stuff like this, you know, we're trying to save rare and endangered species in our national parks and we've surrounded them with us. And now they need to move a thousand miles and how the heck do they get there? And so this study, by the time our students are in the, the center of their careers, a third of the species on earth are on the road to extinction. A third. Okay. And then there's this one. Pop, who is changing the climate? It's red. Who is emitting a lot of CO2 per person per year? It's the reds up here, up here and over here per person per year, right? China more as a country, but not quite as much per person. Who is vulnerable, right? All future generations and poor people in hot places now. So the bottom plot is red is vulnerable. The top plot is red is causing the problem. And you see, they're just the reverse of each other to fair approximation. The more you're causing the problem, the less you're suffering. The, the more you're suffering, the less you're causing the problem, which has caused a number of faith leaders like Pope Francis to say, oh, come on. We believe in the golden rule. We can't believe in this. Okay, so there it is, one slide of each, larger economy, more jobs, improved health, uh, greater national security, and a cleaner environment that's more ethical. All right, how do we do it? I'm going to show you a little bit of a big solution space. This is not all of it, trust me. But I'm going to show you that it's possible. All right. So this is where we get that 2,000 calories per person per day. The orange is crops. We, we plow, we grow. The bottom is grazing. The animals eat grass. We eat the animal or we milk the animal or something, right? Suppose that we decide to replace all the fossil fuels, all the nuclear, all of everything with a modern solar farm. And then we're going to build a little extra so there's some growth going forward. Just to show it to you, I'm going to put it in the Sahara Desert. Now it's not, it's, some of it's on our roof, right? But, but just to show it to you, a modern solar farm that big is more energy than is used by all humans on earth from all sources. Now do not kid anyone, compared to our roof, that's really stinking big. That's 30 years of building. But can it be done? Is the resource there? Sure. Is there any question about that? No. Now, click forward. I, I wrote this book on this a number of years ago, just, just after the last time I spoke here. And we turned it into a three-hour PBS miniseries. And, you know, it was on during Earth Week in 2011 and 2012. And we had 50 million viewers, so nobody saw it. Um, but we got to go talk to these Texas ranchers. And the, the ranch was going broke and the town was going broke. And they were going to close the high school and they put in a wind farm. And they put 5% of the ranch into the wind farm. They left 95% of the ranch as ranch. The wind pays a lot better than the ranch. They call it mailbox money. You go out to the mailbox and you get money. Just for scaling, if you took the parts of the plains and deserts of the world where it blows strong enough that those turbines had run 20% of the time, You'd need 20% of that to supply all human energy. 
Okay. So you saw what was needed for sun. For wind, it's 20% of the windy parts of the plains and deserts of the world is all human energy. Okay. So it's there. And the International Energy Agency, when the when last I was here, they were poo-pooing it. Oh, we can't do renewables. They're not up to snuff. They're going to be expensive. They're going to be slow. They don't do it. By 2020, they said, hey, this is the cheapest electricity in human history. Okay. Now, if you put it on your best farmland, we could do that. We have so much farmland compared to the size needed. But you can think about doing it smart. Right, so this is something Oregon State did. They put the solar out in a, in a meadow. Uh, Oregon State dries out in the summer, but the meadow under the, the solar didn't dry out as fast because they'd get a snow drift under there and it would hang around for a while. And so they got an extra cutting of hay because they were also getting money from their solar. This was one they did in Germany. They've planted various crops. Some of them are under the solar, some of them are not. The solar is high enough you can drive your tractor under it. They did this in a summer that had a drought. And in this particular summer with its drought, the farmer got more food under the solar than they did without it because the cut down on evaporation from the solar beat the cut down in, in sun. So the farmer is selling solar energy to make money and got more food. I mean, there's just times when shade is useful. And because we need only a tiny bit of the total land area that we're using for farming and grazing, you can think about doing it in a smart way. So the farmer gets two crops rather than one. The farmer can afford the taxes on the land. You don't have to close the town. You don't have to close the high school. This study, the, the line down, down near the bottom, is, is global energy demand would be offset by solar production if less than 1% of cropland are converted to an agrivoltaic system, okay? We take land and we grow food and we eat it. We take land and we grow food and we feed it to animals and we eat or milk them. We take land and we grow food and we burn it in our gas tanks. The land we use for food that we burn across the world would pretty much supply all human energy. Biofuels are a little tiny bit, but solar is so much and wind are so much more efficient than what the plants are doing, that if we put that area into, into renewables, it's all energy. If you meet the person who says, we cannot afford the land to do this, if they're not screaming bloody murder about biofuels right now, there's a place for biofuels. I wouldn't say they're all to go away, but be very, very clear. Plants at this point are not that effective at making energy that we can burn easily. Yeah. And there's things like this. If you gotta have an irrigation ditch, why don't you have solar over it? If you gotta have a snow fence along the railroad, why don't you have solar on it? All right. Now. A little bit on cost and then I'll shut up. We're almost there. Um, this is from Lazard. This is the world's largest independent investment bank. This is the cost of adding a little bit of electricity to the grid in the US if we did not subsidize renewables at all. No renewable subsidies. And I'm just going to zoom in. And all you really need on here, left is cheap. So cheap is over here and expensive is over here. And up here are renewables, building new ones. Start from scratch, build a new wind farm, build new sun. Over here is the things we've been doing now. This is coal, this is gas, this is nuclear, um, gas peaking. These two right here are, I have a nuclear plant or I have a coal plant. The plant is completely paid for. There's no mortgage. It's on the grid, it's wired, that's just keeping it running. And they're having troubles just keeping running what's completely paid for compared to building and running new renewables. Okay. Now that's not the whole integrated system, this is adding a little to the grid, but this is why you're seeing coal and nuclear in, in legislatures trying to get bailouts because they can't compete anymore. But 
We let fossil fuels change the climate and they don't pay for it. We let them make us sick and they don't pay for it. And we actually give them a lot of money in tax breaks around the world that they're, they're getting on top. And those were not taken out of that picture. This is a group working with the International Monetary Fund. And they said at the time this paper came out, we were spending six and a half percent of world economic production on subsidies for fossil fuels. That's more or less the cost of the fossil fuels. So every time you spend a dollar on fossil fuel, society spends another dollar. The real cost is twice. And this is how that is evolving over time. And you'll notice that since that paper was, was written, the subsidies have gone up. Okay. So above 7% of the economy now is subsidizing fossil fuels. All right, so be very, very clear. This is a huge task. We love fossil fuels. They do fantastic things for us. We are going to burn some for a while. It's a 30 year transition um, and we'll be at it. Our students will spend their whole careers doing this, but they will have new corporations and new jobs. And we actually know now that this is going to make something better if we do it, okay? And so, and if we make it better, right, the students, are the first generation in all of human history that knows they could do this and that they really can do it in a way that helps the economy and employment and security and health and environment and ethics. So I'm gonna shut up. I'll leave you with a picture I took in Greenland. Can we have a world with icebergs and rainbows? I think we can. So thank you for coming out and we'll see if we can do some questions. <laughs>